Well, it's a week before Christmas in 2019, and we say a very warm welcome home to Scott Kaufman. Oh, thank you. Scott, uh, a famous surname at the <clears throat> CYC, the Kaufman name. How did you become involved at this club? Uh, well, Peter, thanks so much. Um, um, my father uh, sailed up in Pitwater and Stars, and actually his crew was a very famous uh, person, Bob Miller, uh, about to become at a later time Ben Lexon. They um, went down to Melbourne and uh, just missed out on the 1956 Olympic trials down there. My father, after that, decided that he would move on to bigger boats and um, he chose the CYC as a place that he would like to you know, learn more about ocean racing and uh, get started in that world. And so uh, he, came, he joined in 1957 and he started sailing with Merv Davy on trade winds. And I can remember, my mother and father um, uh, met in the city on Friday evenings, came to the Cruising Yacht Club. Um, they had a drink or two. They were not big drinkers by any means, but there were some other big drinkers around, I can assure you. But um, they then went out to dinner and went home and so on and so forth. So I would come some Friday nights and, and um, spend time here. <clears throat> and uh, that would be my earliest recollection, say around 1957, when the club was still the basic boat shed. The clubhouse was upstairs. It was a, a, a simple A-frame roof. There was a back staircase. The bar was almost immediately inside once you got inside the club. There was a little place to sit on the staircase. I remember Mr. Dalton was ensconced there on many a Friday evening that I, I was around. And so, um, yes, yeah, so, the, so Ted's started sailing with trade winds and my first experience sailing here I, I, I had done some sailing up in Pitwater, Byra and small boats and so on but my first big boat experience was sailing on trade winds. It was a, a winter series I imagine 1959, 1960 something like that the the Carl Expressway was open which I think happened in 59 and my father and I would drive on a Sunday morning Bayview to the Cruising Yacht Club, 25 minutes, you could set your clock on it, three traffic lights on the way, and that was it, you know. So I was not allowed on deck on trade winds. Uh, I, had to, I was in the companionway for the racing. But my, <laughs> my recollection of trade winds was uh, the following. When you went down below, she, well, first of all, she'd been built by Merv Davy, uh, designed by Merv, and a two-time two Commodore, I think, of the club. And Merv had had her built all in steel. And the steel was all structurally sound and strong and everything else. The interior was very rudimentary. And um, when you first went down below the chart table to starboard, Merv did like to smoke. And he always had at least two cigarettes going, sometimes three. <laughs> and he liked a bit of a drink, so he always had a... Uh, on a Friday evening, if we went down to the boat, there was um, a glass of rum going, you know. And uh, but in addition to that, um, the boat—you've got to remember the boat was built post World War II. Not a lot of materials available, and so the interior partitions and bulkheads were made out of household plywood, which didn't seem to like the. Um, marine conditions especially, and you could smell dry rot quite extensively. In addition to that, um, at that time, all the sails were cotton. And, uh, you know, after an ocean race at the Cruising Yacht Club, um, my recollection was that everybody dragged their cotton sails out onto the lawn and you had to wash them and dry them and then fold them and put them back on the boat. That was a huge job. But, they had to be done because cotton doesn't like salt water. So Merv doesn't seem to have gotten that message. And um, a lot of the sails were put away wet, I think. And there was also a very strong odor of um, mildew from the sails down below. And that boat also, uh, the structure was that the keel was part of the hull. And they had poured the lead inside. And above the lead was a good dimension space and that's where the bilge water collected. I don't think that the uh, pickup uh, tube on the um, bilge pump actually reached the bottom so there was quite a lot of uh, water down there 
and the smells coming from down there <laughs> were exotic, to say the least. And, um, and then, in addition to that, the boat had a petrol engine. Um, I, I know that that's a no-no, but um, of course, of cost, can you imagine, uh, world, after World War II, the cost of a diesel engine would have been uh, crazy. So, and Merv was one of the few people, even though Merv was only five foot four, he had the touch in starting it. It was all hand crank <laughs> to start it. And it had a carburetor. Now, if the boat heeled over, then petrol spilt into the bilge. And it was not enclosed. It was all open to the air. You could see the engine back there. So that um, mixture in the bilge got more and more exotic. And um, <laughs> on deck, also, the boat was quite interesting because she was a cutter rig. Um, you know, in those days, the reason to have a cutter rig was uh, you could reduce the size of the sails. There were no winches to be had when Merv would have been building the boat. So someone had made a copy of a Merriman winch, the American Merriman winches, and it was a bottom action, so um, quite small. I mean, for the size of boat, it was a 45-footer trade winds. The staysail went to these bottom action winches, which two guys operated. And um, the... Um, the Yankee, the Yankee went to the aft deck to a single winch. <clears throat> and the single winch had been created from the mechanism of a Hill's hoist. And uh, Merv was very proud of that, that he had created this uh, very simple winch uh, with a top action. Now, this one had a top action. And the only thing is that... Um, he uh, had lost a lot of winch handles because out in the ocean, way back on the stern of the boat, guys had tried to rip off the, the turns and uh, handle had gone over the side. So his solution to losing the winch handle was to weld it in place. You know. <laughs> so now, if you're going about, then you have to take un all the wraps off the outside of the handle and then put the new one on on the new side. It was quite, a, <laughs> quite an experience. So um, that was my first uh, recollection of, um, uh, of sailing at the club. That, I think, around 1960. Yeah, well, that boat, of course, won a Hobart race in 1949. Exactly. And no, no, uh, and I don't think yeah. much had been changed no. <laughs> since, since but, then. But did then you go ocean racing after that as such, or you were harbour racing then with your dad, Ted? That and, was the winter series. Yeah, and, and, and then did, how did you I break into I never went ocean? ocean racing with those guys. Right. Ted, Ted went ocean yes. racing with them. Yeah. And his next move was to build a 42-foot boat, Mercedes 2, he had a factory up um, the Parramatta River. And your dad, Hortley. Ted, was an engineer? My father was an yeah, engineer, yeah. but he had got the plans from um, Philip Rhodes mm -hmm. in, uh, I guess Rhodes was in Boston or somewhere around Boston. And it took a year and a half to build the boat. Um, I only remember because I worked on it for two summers. And um, she was launched at the slipway here. In um, well, the, the christening was at the slipway. She was actually put in the water at Mortlake, but um, so um, that slipway was thoroughly operational back then. I guess the club had originally just been a boat shed, mm -hmm. right? And um, there were two, if I remember correctly, there were two uh, rail tracks, two sets of rail tracks one of which could accommodate a pretty damn big boat. Um, uh, and I remember being, a, we, w we were allowed to work on the boats, but the staff at the CYC were the only people who could be anywhere near them when they put them in and out mm. of the water. And it was quite a, they could accommodate two and two. So four boats could be on the slips. Um, and I remember very well, um, being on the slips um, uh, in 1963, when by that time the club had had its new clubhouse, the top part had changed. So it had been the modern, uh, the modern flat top, uh, flat roof clubhouse had been revised, and it had sliding glass windows. Mm -hmm. And I remember being on the slipway in 1963 in November uh, and somebody opened up the window and screamed out, JFK has been shot. 
you know. Um, so that was a, uh, a bit of a memory. Um, but we first started racing in, <clears throat> in 62, and we did all the races. And um, I remember very well doing the Montague Island race several times. I don't think the club does that anymore. No. no. I remember one in particular where it could have been 63. I um, got permission from school to leave school early. All the races started on a Friday afternoon at 5 p.m., if I remember Correct. correctly. Yep. And so I, I got the bus in from Narrabeen Boys High at um, noon and Wynyard somehow made my way down here. Race starts at five o'clock. We go out uh, off the heads and there's a good southerly blowing. We beat and beat and beat and beat all the way down to Montague Island. We get down there on Sunday morning. We get the spinnaker up for about two hours and all of a sudden the breeze shifts around to the northeast. <laughs> And we beat and beat and beat and beat. We finished that race uh, Tuesday morning at one o'clock. We came in, packed, cleaned the boat up a bit. Um, I maybe got an hour's sleep and showered here. And um, my father dropped me off at school <laughs> at 8 a.m. On, uh, on Tuesday morning. It was the long, they had a long yeah, weekend, right. you know, a right. long weekend. And so that was my weekend of sailing and, and uh, the wonderful um, Montague Island race. So you obviously learnt the ropes in that, as a youngster on Mercedes 2 oh, with, yeah. with your dad. And oh, absolutely. Other yeah. characters, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started doing the Hobart from 62 on. And I don't think you can do it at that age anymore. You can't. No. So no. I was 14 or 15. Mm. You've got to be 18 now. Right. Yeah. So I had already done three or four races mm -hmm. by the time I was 18. All on Mercedes at that stage? Uh, well, I'd have to think back. I, I did. Maybe I did the 62 on Sea Wind, which was a guy, Harold Vaughan mm -hmm. um, from Brookvale. Um, but the 63, 4 and 5 I did on Mercedes. Right. 3 and 2, 2. I... I remember very well <clears throat> down here, 62 Hobart. Um, uh, it was that was the year of Solo versus Ondine, and Ondine had arrived um, from the States, and she was in the position of honour right here, and of course just up a little bit beyond was Solo, and. Two more, well, uh, let me explain that Ondine was, the captain on Ondine was this guy called Sven Jops, and he was Norwegian, Scandinavian, you know, whatever. I mean, as, I never once saw him smile, let's put it that way, you know. Uh, so he was famous, um, he was an excellent captain, I mean, no doubt about it, but he, he was famous for sort of encouraging people to come on this wonderful Pacific trip to bring the boat to Australia, and they did it many times. Little did these maybe college kids know that not only were they standing a watch, but that the, the whole day was going to be spent varnishing and painting. <laughs> you know, so he got his money's worth out of these guys. Anyhow, you had two great characters. You had Sven Joffs and you had Vic Meyer. Did you know Vic? Yeah. yeah. So for some reason, I'm, I'm a 14-year-old kid wandering the docks here trying to help, you know, uh, get the boat ready for the Hobart race. And I made friends with both of those guys, you know. And Vic, once down here, uh, underneath the clubhouse, the new 60s square flat roof clubhouse, was still all uh, storage bins and the change rooms and so on. Vic had two storage bins. And inside, he asked me in one day, and inside his uh, storage bins was a full-blown workshop. workshop. I mean, my God, welding, Lights. lathes, <laughs> everything you could imagine. Vic did everything himself. And, um, and the other guy, Sven, you know, was always working on the boat, everything meticulous and perfect. And you had these two characters, you know. And, of course, they were one and two in the race, and... Uh, I think Solo won that year. They and, did, uh, yeah. 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 And I, I remember, you know, sort of that, at that era, in that era, uh, the boats, the, we, there was only obviously the one uh, marina, uh, and at the very end was Asta. 
beautiful old 70, 80 foot schooner. I mean, magnificent. I mean, old school, really old school. And on this side, you had the Solo and the Tasman Seabirds, and you had um, Southern Maid, mm. you know, Phil Deaton, mm. Tahuna, Salacia, mm. you know. Uh, on the other side, uh, Tani, Jeff Ormanston, mm. and our boat, Mercedes Two, and I, you know, th th those style of boats, Lass of Lass, and mm. uh, it was just a, obviously a different era. Yeah. And, um, but some those boats that you mentioned have, have all got a, a great place in the history of the CYC. Oh, absolutely, the, yeah. the, the Tasman Seabirds, yeah. and um, I don't think there are any of the Camille class here, but maybe, maybe. But I remember, um, <clears throat> for example, doing the um, uh, 63 Hobart race, um, where, you know, it did come into blow. 62, Mercedes 2 didn't do very well, but Ted got a much better crew together for 63, and um, a guy called Peter Brown mm. was an excellent sailor. I mean, skiff guy, and he steered the boat mostly. And we had a really good crew. We got down to Tasman Island, and um, it started to blow. I mean, you know, um, everyone talks about 40 knots and so on and so forth, but this was, this was quite a bit of breeze. And um, we reefed down everything, roller reefing, mm. as you remember in those days. And we went straight out from Tasman Island, went about four hours, four and a half hours. We tacked. We barely made it to Cape Rao, <laughs> you know, after eight hours of sailing. And um, we learnt a lot because, you know, Storm Bay is, is so big and you've got the Derwent exiting into it. And with a sou'wester blowing, you just get immense wind-driven wind, wind current there. Camille, or, or one of the Tasman Seabirds, Ron Swanson's boat, had been, I can't remember the exact names, but one of the smaller boats had been with us at Tasman Island, and they had tacked, short tack all the way up to Cape Rao and kept on going. They beat us by hours and hours and hours, you know. Um, but I do remember one other thing. When we, when we got up towards the Derwent Iron Pot, we didn't want to... We, we'd learnt our lesson, so we didn't want to go into the current. And we, we were made a tack into Frederick Henry Bay, I think it is. And then our last tack was going to be at Iron Pot and up. We got in close to the shore, and a gust came off the shore and hit us and just knocked the boat flat. And sandblasted, the sand came off the beach, sandblasted one side of the boat. So when we got, got into Constitution, one side was white and one side was almost grey because under, all the undercoat was exposed, you know. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was, that was breezy. Yeah. That was yeah. really breezy, that race. Um, um, we'll, we'll step forward a little yeah. and um, <clears throat> I'll take you into Mercedes 3. Okay. Which was a wonder boat. Yes. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. An absolute wonder boat. Yes. Um, your dad had gone to Sesquilkey and yes. uh, coal moulded construction. How did he get to go to Ses? Where did he find Ses? Or well, how did he find uh, Ses? You know, back in that era, and we'd just, uh, there was, this was the era of the ROIC. Right. On about 1966, I think she was launched for yes. the 67 Admirals Cup. Yes, That's, exactly. So yeah. we, did she do the 66 Hobart race? We'd have to have a look. But, um, you know, it was all about ballast ratio. So the English boats we kept reading were very, very high ballast ratio. Um, they were built by Camper and Nicholson mm -hmm. and other Lallos and various other people. And um, somebody told Ted, well, there's a guy building uh, power boats down in the south. San Susie. San Susie, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And he's won, his powerboats are winning everything. They're super light and super strong, and uh, he seems like a very capable guy. So I remember going with my father down to meet him and talk to him. And Ted explained the project, and because he, he'd never built a yacht before, you know, mm -hmm. strictly a powerboat and small powerboats, you know. But um, Sess is a very enthusiastic guy, and uh, it, it, Ted and Sess got along like a house on fire immediately, you know. And so um, Ted showed him all the plans, 
and um, explained what he was trying to do. And Seth said, well, let me think about that. And um, called him up a day or two later and said, because the, the goal was to get to 50% ballast, um, ballast ratio. 50% boat, 50% ballast. And um, Seth called him up and said, I think I can do it. You know. And uh, so off they went. And indeed, you know, they did do it. I mean, they, the boat was, had a nice interior, a very simple interior, but there was no weight expended in the interior and all the weight was in the structure and mm. hull and um, everything else. Mm. So, well, There's been a question that I will ask that uh, it's, a lot of people have said, who designed Mercedes right. 3? So yeah. I can like, assure, I I'd can like tell to you ask you now, who I can designed tell you, Mercedes 3? I can 3? give you the answer. You know, um, Ted uh, and Bob had had a long relationship. Bob Miller. Yeah. Bob Miller, mm-hmm. yes, had had a long relationship. I mean, uh, Bob, um, when he was crewing for Ted, would come down every weekend and stay at the house. And uh, um, so they knew each other for years and years. And, you know, everybody knew that Bob was a genius. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, he, he just had that um, distinctive flair. And mm-hmm. he, when I, uh, he used to babysit for me when I was a kid, but... Um, if you can imagine, but uh, he had he was mad about cars. I don't know he, he, yep. he had a lot of Ferraris and different cars, and he was always sketching. I mean, you could just tell by his drawings that he just his his eye was just fantastic, you know. And Ted and he talked and talked and talked about this bigger boat, new boat, and everything. And Bob definitely did drew the lines, you know. And and I I, I have those lines, and I can tell you why. Um, you, if, you're, if you've ever done any drafting, there are people who draft in pencil and there are people who draft in ink. Bob always drafted in ink. And the lines plan is in ink. My father always drafted in pencil. He did all the... Bob only did the very, very basics. He did the lines. The, they worked together on the sail plan. All the rest of the drawings, the interior, the structural elements, everything was all, all done by my father. But the lines were done by Bob. And then when... Uh, Dennis O'Neill asked Ted to do Kumaloo, Ted did design Kumaloo for sure um, because he took that boat and modified it in certain ways and so on. But um, no, I, I, have the, I have the lines plan at Mercedes and it's definitely done by Bob. You know. Yeah, well it's a credit to both of them because she went to the Admiral's Cup and we won the Admiral's Cup and she was top scoring boat. Top scoring boat yeah, by far. Wonderful, yeah. 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 Um, so Scott, uh, want to talk about you specifically, Olympic Games. Yes. That oh. must have been a great thrill to be selected to go to represent Australia. Oh, yes. In Acapulco we, uh, or Mexico Games as they were. Yeah, yeah. we had a, an, an amazing uh, experience because I had sailed with a group from um, uh, a, well, 1964 to 68. I sailed with Frank Tolhurst and, um, and three of us, uh, Keith Ravel was the... the uh, the third, and Keith only wanted to do the bow, Frank steered, so I got to do the middle of the boat. Now, 64, I was 16 years of age, um, but we sailed for four years together, and we got better and better and better. At, at but did end, you do the Olympic trials in 64? With when, No. No. No, okay. no, I did no. not, but, but um, we were active sailing at that time, mm-hmm. or right after that was when th- this group got together. And we had an old looter's boat and kept changing it and modifying it, new sails and new masts and everything. And and finally, by the time we got to the trials, we did did the King's Cup, which they used to have in the harbour here. And um, we, meaning Frank and Keith and I, won that. And we thought, wow, you know, because there were so many other boats being built. The Olympic trials were going to be in February and March. And um, there were maybe six or seven brand new boats. There were masts, sails, I can't tell you. It was a huge amount of development and people building and doing things. We had this four-year-old boat. So we thought, okay, Frank said, well, what, what about if we build a new boat? So between New Year's Day and the end of February, we, Bob Miller designed the boat. I helped him do the fittings because all the all the floors in those boats have to be done to Lloyd standards. They have to be individually designed. You know all the floors and chain plates and bows. 
head stay, back stay, have to be approved. But in that eight week period up at Kenny Bischel's shop, we built King's Cross. Got towed down to Botany Bay where the Olympic trials are. We raced right where the runway is now, as a matter of fact. Uh, that's where the Olympic trials are held. And um, we did the Australian Championships prior to the Olympic trials. We were winning the Australian Championships and um, we only had to turn the last mark, go upwind. We could lose two or three boats and we would have won the Australian Championships. Lo and behold, we get involved in a, an infraction with, I, I know you're going to be shocked by this, by, by Gordon Ingate. <laughs> you know. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, yes. <laughs> So we are out of the Australian Championship. And I, um, I said to Keith and Frank, I said, look, I'm supposed to be university. I don't know, mate. I just don't think we're quite ready for the, for the Olympics yet. And um, anyhow, uh, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sail in the Olympic trials. So um, there had been some other upsetting crew developments. And... Um, Bill Solomons had also had a, 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 a upset with his gang, and he didn't have a boat to sail on. So the long and the short is that he went to Bill Northam and, and chartered Baron Joey. She had bird poo on the deck and weed on the bottom. She was on a mooring of Bayview. And anyhow, boat goes down to uh, Botany Bay, Original 1964 sails, the ones they used to win the gold medal in, in Tokyo. And um, we went out there. Uh, Mick York was on the bow. I did the middle. And uh, lo and behold, we, on the last day, we won the last race, which tied us with Norman G. Booth. And on a count back, we had three wins to his two wins. And I have to say that when we went ashore, not many people came up and congratulated us. So it, was, it was pretty tough. But you became an Olympian. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it was very, I mean, for me, a 19-year-old kid going to the Olympics, it was amazing, you know. Yeah.